When it comes to the Jurassic Park franchise, a lot of people consider the original to be one of the best blockbusters ever made, but there are also a lot who believe that the movie didn't necessarily need any sequels. Even I myself kind of agree with this opinion while also being a big fan, but the more I look into the franchise, the more interesting it gets with how these films were made and how those decisions affected the others. Prioritizing dinosaur scenes over characters is one aspect that really interests a lot of people, and the ending of the original movie even had some of that, but Believe it or not, the making of that same film from 1993 happened to have some discussions into how exactly the world of Jurassic Park would take shape had things actually progressed towards the dinosaur park eventually becoming open to the public. Brief conversations, but I found all that stuff to be really interesting. What's going on guys? Hope you're all doing well. Now for today's video, I wanted to talk about an alternate ending to the original Jurassic Park that was abandoned in favor of the Tyrannosaurus Rex versus Raptor battle that happened at the end of the first movie. Now for those of you who don't know already, Steven Spielberg changed this part of the film because he believed the audience would be upset with him if he didn't bring back the T-Rex from earlier in the movie. I guess he knew ahead of time that it would be a pretty big deal in audience pleasers, so he decided to change how the film initially ends in favor of doing this more block blockbuster style attack. Speaking of that abandoned ending, had this been used in Jurassic Park, it could have radically changed the trajectory of the series in my opinion because it involves the completion of a character arc by one person in particular that kind of alters how we view the dinosaurs and the ultimate meaning of Jurassic Park and why it's a failure as a resort in general. Anyways, the ending would have involved Alan Grant and the Raptors facing off inside of the Visitor Center. These storyboards detail how instead of the T-Rex being the one to kill them, Grant initially takes one out on his own, but when the other Velociraptor shows up to start some chaos, it leaps into the air and is shot dead by someone off screen. The characters look at the fallen body of the raptor and then turn their attention to who shot it, and the reveal would be none other than John Hammond of all people, who showed up at the perfect time to save his grandkids and help everyone else escape. Now just so you guys know, there was another deleted sequence that I think they probably thought of when they were trying to work the T-Rex back into the finale that involved everyone making a break for the helicopter and the Tyrannosaurus grabbing a hold of it while they took off. This of course was reused as the opening of Fallen Kingdom. But anyways, when it comes to how John Hammond took out the raptors in the abandoned ending of Jurassic Park, this kind of alters his character a lot because it allows him to complete what is sort of left up in the air in the final cut of the film. You see, at the end of the movie they released, Hammond doesn't really want to leave the island initially, and he's even seen looking at the amber cane on the helicopter in some sort of depressed anguish that his dream didn't work out. I know that he says he doesn't endorse Jurassic Park when everyone else is leaving, but remember, just just earlier in the film he called the dinosaur attacks nothing more than a delay. Jurassic Park Trespassers Strategy Guide even has this small excerpt that says that Jurassic Park may even be opened up one day, which ultimately, look, it was with the old man's dying wish that we got information on in Jurassic World, but anyways, going back to this alternate ending from the first movie, you really can't do any of that sequel stuff convincingly, in my opinion, if you have Hammond be the one to kill the raptors at the end of Jurassic Park. Because in relation to what we've seen happen earlier, you know, like actually imprinting on the animals when they're born, which were raptors, by the way, which would have made the ending, you know, have more of that character arc punch. You know, this guy deeply cares about what he's built here and what it means for his legacy, so to take one of the animals out in order to save his family is pretty awesome and a complete rejection of Jurassic Park ever working, in my opinion. Even in the storyboards, he's got this kind of look like, come on, let's get out of here, I'm done, and I honestly really like it. Of course, if that had happened, we wouldn't have gotten the awesome T Rex versus Raptor battle at the end of the film, and it wouldn't be anywhere near as iconic. But dare I say, it would have made for a better character arc had the film actually committed to this idea. But you know what? In the end, they just didn't. And I mean, honestly, guys, it would have changed everything that came after. Look, let's say Lost World Jurassic Park starts, and you got Hammond there laying in his bed, like, hey, remember that part where I shot that Velociraptor that was going to attack Alan and my grandkids? Yeah, cool stuff, right? Anyways, I want you to go to Site B. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of like go from there. I mean, granted, he was trying to prevent 
another Jurassic Park opening, I guess. But uh, nah, I just I can't see the further trajectory of the series being similar because Hammond's arc is so concrete in this original ending that they abandoned. And I, I do like it. It does make for good filmmaking. But again, you know what else makes for really good filmmaking, man? A Tyrannosaurus killing Velociraptors, throwing one into a T-Rex skeleton and having a banner fall down. It's just awesome. Now, even though I've just said all this stuff, I am going to provide a very good counter argument because while I know for certain that not everything in the sequels would be identical had this end been used just from, you know, common sense, like, you know, maybe a dying John Hammond would not have made it his final wish for the park to be opened, which the seeds of him having regrets were already in Jurassic Park, but still saying that, I don't know for a fact that another movie wouldn't have been made in the series because there is some information on a story back in 1993 that makes it seem like an inevitable thing, but I'm going to leave that to all of you to be the judge on. I definitely don't see Hammond ever saying that the park should be opened one day after he kills one of his own animals while saving his grandkids. And I not only say that because of how Hammond appears here in storyboards, but also because, believe it or not, the production team behind Jurassic Park actually talked extensively about how they designed that first park to be in an incomplete state rather than a finished product like what we see in Jurassic World. All of that stuff was done on purpose, and what's even more interesting is the fact that they even go into detail into what the park would look like if it were up and running, which really blew my mind. But I think pulling the attention away from Hammond's killing of the raptor, you know, his story arc, and onto the new ending of the T-Rex coming in to save the day, kind of paved the way for the sequels because it took its focus away from John Hammond as a person and onto the dinosaurs themselves. What do I mean by all of this? Well, in the first making of book, they have a pretty detailed breakdown on how everything was made for the first movie. From Michael Crichton's writing process to the hiring of Stan Winston and the designs of the dinosaurs and environments that we'd seen in the movie. One of the things that people found to be really distinct and different about the fourth film in the franchise, Jurassic World, was the fact that the finished park looked pretty different to what we'd see in the original from 93. And while there may be loads of different factors for that, just reading over this small bit of text not only makes you raise an eyebrow into how that sequel was designed and made, but even as far as the plot of Jurassic World goes with a little bit of information on what kinds of creatures the park would clone in the future and how they do that for sales as well as the timeline in general. Well, all of that stuff I found to be kind of fascinating because what I'm trying to say here, guys, look, to break this down, the making of Jurassic Park book from 1993 kind of perfectly describes Jurassic World from 2015 to a point where it's kind of wild to even think about. The following can be found in the making of Jurassic Park book and happens to be a quote from production designer Rick Carter who states the following. From a design standpoint, the stars of Jurassic Park are the dinosaurs. That's not to say the characters aren't important, because they are, but on a visual level, the dinosaurs are the stars. And I think the island is very strong as a setting. So I really did not want to have the park be a lot of commercialized edifices that feel shallow and overly bright and overly energetic. Even though that is something that the park would probably evolve into if it were finished, I thought as a film, it would be shallow. This is, after all, not Disneyland. What people would go to see in Jurassic Park would be the dinosaurs and their natural habitat. Not a lot of man-made stuff. For the first 10 years at least, it would probably be taken very seriously until somebody started making sideshow freaks out of the dinosaurs. So for me, that was one of the advantages of having the park not be finished. I wasn't forced to take it to its completion as an idea in terms of what it might turn into if it really were brought all the way to the point where the park was opening. If it were opening, the tendency would be to have more and more things for the people as opposed to the park being just a window that allows one to enter into this new world that the dinosaurs are in. So reading that, just, you know, doing research and having fun being a Jurassic Park fan, it kind of blows your mind, man, because he even breaks down the 10-year time span, which in Jurassic World, it has been 10 years since they opened up the park back in 2005. The Indominus Rex, a sideshow freak, is what they're using to bring out and try to get people to, you know 
come see Jurassic Park again. One of the big things about Jurassic World was the fact that Bryce Dallas Howard's character of Claire Deering says that nobody's excited by a real dinosaur anymore. They have to up ticket sales, and the way to do that is to make these bigger and bigger and crazier wild creations in order to get people to come back. And Rick Carter even says back in the making of the first Jurassic Park that the tendency would be to have more and more things for the people as opposed to the park being just a window that allows one to enter into this new world that the dinosaurs are in. And he likes the fact that he wasn't forced to take it to its completion when it was opening because he correctly predicted that when Jurassic World or Park or whatever you want to call it was open to the public, realistically it would go in this direction. It would be very commercialized like Disneyland, very bright, very energetic, and he thought it would be kind of shallow, which is fascinating because one of the biggest critiques for Jurassic World when it came out was that it was kind of a shallow replication of Jurassic Park that was very commercialized, very big and in your face, and yeah, that's it's just very interesting to see how this series progressed, and I don't know if Colin or Derek Connolly or anybody looked at the making of Jurassic Park book specifically right here when they were writing that fourth movie, but dude, you gotta admit, like, this is pretty spot on. Now, just a paragraph before that, Rick Carter actually starts by going over the Jurassic Park design and themes, which I found to be really awesome. The park is not as finished as it is in the book, noted Carter. The movie is probably nine months or a year earlier than when the book takes place. What we were trying to convey was that this is a process. The park is in the final stages of completion, but it is never completed. The building of the perfect dinosaur is not quite there yet. The building of the perfect park is not quite there. The building of the perfect security system is not quite there. Building the perfect anything is impossible, especially when one is dealing with nature. The best we can do is never really good enough because we are not God, which is one of the major themes of this movie and one that relates directly to bioengineering. Just because you can do something, does it mean you really should do it? And that's, you know, one of the things I always love about Jurassic Park is it's all about what you shouldn't do in terms of nature, science, playing God. It's one of the reasons Jurassic World Dominion's ending left me feeling kind of depressed and just upset in a fan level, not personally, but that's really not the message of Jurassic Park to have all these animals all around the world and not be a problem. They really would be a problem. And I think with what Rick Carter says here about Jurassic Park's future, about, you know, like for the first 10 years, it'd be taken seriously with real dinosaurs, but then it would be overly commercialized and would have sideshow freaks and stuff. That's fascinating, man. All of this stuff is back in 1993. They're literally without it, I guess without even knowing it, kind of predicting the future. And I just thought that that was it's really fun to learn about. It, it, it's so funny how this stuff, you know, lines up, man. To be more bright and commercialized and energetic and Disneylandish, which is what Jurassic World was going for. A lot of that movie is based around the self-awareness that Jurassic Park shouldn't work, and the fact that it is a theme park, you know, Jurassic World and its completion, selling out tickets to sideshow freak dinosaur hybrids and all kind of wild stuff like that. Wow, it's Kind of fascinating. Now, personally, I'm a bigger fan of Jurassic Park and the aesthetic around that. I don't hate Jurassic World at all. I've loved it since it came out. I think it's a very fun movie, and the themes of progress versus tradition, I really enjoy in that film, you know? No, I'm not saying that eventually someone wouldn't have okayed the construction of Jurassic Park down the line even after Hammond killed the raptor and saved everyone at the end of the 1993 film, but I do think that we would have gotten a different franchise had that been the case. Because the whole construction of the first Jurassic Park movie was all based around the idea of the park not being able to work, and they even plot out the logic and amusement park reasoning behind the story of Jurassic World way back in the 90s just on a whim. I know it was just something he was saying, but it is so surreal that that ended up being the basis of a future movie. And still, do you really think Lost World, JP3, and the others would have had an identical production had this been used in place of the T-Rex versus Raptors finale? I mean, I just don't see that. For me, man, I really doubt it. And who knows, they may even have just jumped into Jurassic Park 2 being something like Jurassic World for all we know. Maybe even with that Barbasol can being the catalyst for it before jumping ahead 10 years. That's all just fan speculation, of course, but if you're really into this franchise, you gotta admit, the behind the scenes stuff for the movies can be extremely cool. Anyways, guys, those are all my own thoughts on this abandoned ending and storyboards that go along with it. Like I said, there's other stuff about a helicopter flying off and the T-Rex attacking that, but I did a video on that 
like five years ago. So whatever your own thoughts and opinions are on these storyboards and what they mean, whatever that happens to be, I'd love to hear them in the comments down below. Now before I go, I'd like to thank all of my game wardens and engine executives as well as all of my park workers and engine hunters as well. You've all helped my channel immensely, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of that support. Now I'd like to thank you all for watching today's video and hope that you enjoyed the content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you all consider subscribing. I'll see you all in the next video, guys, and as always, take it easy.